Thank you, Nathan. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk with colleagues today at uh, IEEE GRSS. My background is remote sensing. I began weather satellites, uh, the GOES and GMS series at Hughes Aircraft some years ago, and have worked at uh, NASA's EOS disk system. And um, since um, 2007, I'm now uh, part of the Open Geospatial Consortium. And uh, that includes a large portion of our geospatial remote sensing, uh, as well as other kinds of geospatial location data. Uh, so uh, allow me today to focus on the API efforts that we've got in order to um, provide a background associated with those APIs. I'll talk a little bit about what OGC is. I'll talk a little bit about our strategy for identifying emerging technology and then um, launch directly into the APIs as a, as a prime example of how we're advancing the access to geospatial information. So uh, with respect to OGC, uh, we're a global consortium. We're a not-for-profit organization, 500 industry, government, uh, research and academic uh, member organizations. Uh, we're a, a hub for thought leadership. So our working groups um, address all kinds of geospatial information. We have one specifically on earth system science uh, that is an umbrella for uh, earth observation exploitation, image exploitation, uh, hydrology, geology, all the different earth sciences. Uh, neutral and trusted forums. So uh, organizations participate in our, uh, our, our activities because they're looking for that kind of uh, white hat uh, discussions that the, they can go into, say, in a commercial environment and compete into a research organization and, and develop research. At the end of the day, we're also a consensus-based open standards organization. So we run an activity that uh, focused on consensus, uh, voting and vetting on standards. Anyone could participate, open rules for how that gets to, uh, to be achieved as setting an open standard. So pairing that open consensus approach with implementation uh, for the best uh, standards uh, that have, are backed up by implementation and open consensus is really key to what we do. Uh, as a description of the organizations, the 500 organizations that are members, we have an MOU with uh, IEEE GRSS. We've been um, uh, coordinating with GRSS for, for decades. Um, uh, the, 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 the rich uh, diversity of members across commercial, government, and research and academic is one of our strengths. And that allows us to get um, requirements from government uh, missions and agencies. Um, work with research and academia to see how that um, uh, uh, technology is developing and then transition that uh, into commercial products that are supported, deployed for the long term through open standards and the ecosystem that open standards uh, define. So that's kind of OGC in general. I uh, encourage you to check out the OGC.org webpage about that. So one of the key things that we do with respect to um, establishing and um, that open forum and the like is looking at innovation, geospatial innovation, and in particular technology trends. Uh, looking at OGC technology trends, doing the research behind that in order to understand where research, commercial, government agencies are going. You can go to that link to get some uh, details. This gives you a sense of the breadth of the technology areas in which we track the um, emerging, emerging technology, the location of position, spatial temporal models, data science, user interfaces, uh, physical geosciences, social geosciences, sensing and observation. So a heavy bit there with respect to remote sensing uh, and then computer engineering, of course, a lot of um, trends coming out of computer engineering for remote sensing and, uh, and the geosciences and the like. So uh, in each of these areas, we are, you know, the next level down is about 50 individual trends that we're tracking. Uh, and for each of those trends, uh, we, we keep track of uh, articles, published articles. So we're looking at around a thousand articles every quarter in which we're um, looking at this um, reach of technology. Uh, so we need some tools to do that. One of the tools that's online is the Geospatial Technology Explorer. We work with a group called Big Knowledge to create a 1300 dimensional concept space based upon AI and natural learning, uh, natural language processing. So able to search and understand complex relationships of geospatial technology. 
uh, we've designed an interface with respect to IEEE digital library and would look forward to discussions about how we might advance that forward uh, because the digital library, IEEE digital library is one of the, uh, the key resources that we use uh, with respect to that technology trends and so how to increase that. This is kind of the first instance of where I've got something very uh, concrete in which we're, uh, that MOU is coordinated. I'll show you several others. Out of that research, out of those technology analysis, uh, we've identified uh, 12 um, uh, trends, uh, which are clusters of those individual uh, technologies in order to handle them a little bit more efficiently. And in particular, I'll point to two of them, uh, new space exploitation and open API management. And so let me speak just in one slide about new space exploitation, and then I'll go in depth here momentarily about uh, open APIs, geospatial APIs, and then uh, management of an ecosystem of those APIs. With respect to new space exploitation, we conducted uh, actually two workshops now on new space. Uh, this is the one from May that was uh, jointly sponsored by GRSS. So this report uh, you can find on the web um, and uh, you know, sponsored by GRSS gives a summary of these three sessions about um, technologies in space, uh, new sensors, uh, data curation, uh, data processing, and creating data science activities, and then analytics. So a really rich discussion that happened uh, back in May, and we continued to harvest ideas from that. There was a, another workshop, a uh, new space workshop, um, just a few weeks ago, uh, more focused on Europe, and uh, so good results coming out of that as well. So another good example of the coordination between OGC and GRSS around remote sensing and geoscience. I encourage you to go take a look at this report. Okay, so let's dive into then the main topic that was advertised for this uh, webinar today, and that is the OGC APIs. So why, OP, why APIs in general and why OGC APIs? So, um, you know, if you're a software developer, you already know this is uh, an effective and popular way for rapid software development. It's the way interoperability gets achieved. Uh, what we also know is that variations in those APIs degrade interoperability. If you look at the variety of ways in which remote sense data can be accessed using APIs, there's a large variety. Some of those differences are small, some of them are big, some of them lead to errors, a lot of them lead to excess, uh, ex extra uh, development activity that if they were the same APIs if the variations weren't there, uh, we would be much more efficient. Um, the open standards for the interoperability of in independent implementations is uh, one of the things that's key to our mission, um, and that is the ability to write those standards so it doesn't depend on any given implementation, you're not locked into an implementation, but rather the interoperability is assured by multiple independent implementations that you can trust and do plug and play about. And so uh, we're endeavoring to uh, take a look at the OGC APIs, uh, develop those based upon learning from OWS, OGC Web Services. Um, so let me give you an example of what's achieved with that interoperability. Here is you know, six uh, map tiles, each coming from a different server. Actually, two of them are from the same server. Um, all different APIs, and if you, you know, tweak with all of the variations of the APIs for those map servers, you can get a tiles that then go together in this grid and you can make this happen, right? It's a whole lot easier if there's a single API that everybody agrees upon that then can be used to access the tiles and then integrated seamlessly with the same semantics. So that's kind of the, the notion of what we're after with common uh, API uh, semantics uh, used by all, everything behind the interface, you know, go, go crazy on your own efficient implementation at the interface is the only part that we're worried about. We're going to build these uh, based upon the uh, OGC web services. Uh, there's an operational baseline out there of millions of geospatial data sets on more than 200,000 servers of what we call OGC web services, web map service, web map tile service, uh, web feature service, web coverage service. So the W star S series. Um, these were designed back around the, you know, 2000, 2005 over time. Um, and the design principles for web services at that point are different, were different than they are today. 
And so we were very effective in making use of the design principles that existed at the time. You know, the operational baseline is there, it works. It's a little kludgy with respect to the current design principles, toolkits, SDKs for uh, web APIs today. And so we've undertaken this uh, development of a uh, set of web APIs based upon uh, these principles. Uh, Spatial Data on the Web Best Practices is a document that was jointly published by OGC and W3C a couple of years ago, calls out some, for some best practices about putting spatial data on the web. That lies, gives us a good basis for uh, a big part of what we're doing here. The, our approach uses, leverages what's called open API. Um, it used to be called Swagger. Uh, it's now an open consortium for open API to be able to share APIs in an efficient way. Uh, we focus on developer and experience and usability. You'll see that through the sprints that uh, have been the hallmark of what the API development has been. We have a building block strategy for the modularity associated with the standards and so the ability to define methods that can be used in multiple places. So the API methods that are grouped together into interfaces that can be used in different ways in a building block approach. And uh, I'll show you examples of how the open development public GitHub early implementation in depth validation. Uh, the message, uh, I'll, I'll say it here and I'll say it at the end, if you're using OGC web services, you should start planning now for operational systems that go to OGC APIs. If you don't have <laughs> OWS, you can start, you know, Greenfield with API, OGC APIs now. So what do we mean by spatial data and how does that get represented? Um, so this graphically gives you a sense of the kinds of things that we're talking about. Uh, web APIs are resource oriented, uh, REST, uh, resource oriented. So what are the geospatial resources that are of, um, uh, of, of interest to geospatial and location in general? Certainly records, metadata uh, is a key one. Maps, absolutely 2D maps. So the GIS uh, model of 2D you know, maps that layer on top of each other. 3D uh, visualization and time series are also critically important. So that top row is kind of the, the surface that uh, many people will make use of. There's a bunch of stuff underneath there that also gets represented. So sometimes maps are represented as tiles, so map tiles, and whether that's vector tiles or tiles with data points, like say surface temperature or something, um, is, uh, is a way to represent that. And then, you know, how do you tile the surface of the earth? How do you set up a tessellation based on a geometry on the surface of the earth and a resolution pyramid? The existing tile matrix set specification from the web map tile service is a key hallmark that is usable across these different items. Below that then, features in geometry, imagery and gridded data. So features in geometry, you know, a GeoJSON file has a feature in it, but then it's got geometry like points, lines, and polygons with coordinates and the definition of those uh, geometries that can be then used into uh, vector tiles or styled into maps. Uh, similarly, with imagery and gridded data, you can create uh, map tiles from imagery and gridded data. You can also access that imagery and gridded data directly and do analytics on that. And uh, you know, there's a whole discussion going on now about uh, how best to access those data cubes and what are the formats and what are the uh, languages and the, um, the APIs at the uh, language level in order to interrogate that data. Um, if you look at coverages, it's a little bit more abstract model that says there's a mathematical space in which data points can be uh, interpolated between each other because you have the notion of a math model on top of a gridded data model. So they're related, but they're a little bit different. Observations from sensors and trajectories. These are our resources. These are the key resources that hopefully look familiar to you as a geoscience and remote sensing expert. What we wanna be able to do is take those resources and put APIs on them, web APIs. And so what we have is this set of APIs. So we have an API for metadata called OGC API records. Uh, API for maps, API for tiles, API features, API coverages, API for environmental data retrieval is the EDR one. Uh, there's also emerging and existing actually several um, ways to get after 3D portrayal, I3S and 3D tiles. And so this is the heart of what we want to talk about. This is what we're developing standards right now for is these APIs. 
in a way that provides access to geospatial resources that's consistent. And so you can do you know, fusion of different uh, data from different API accesses. You can create link data that says, well, I've got a map of this feature and this coverage um, and a variety of other things that rely upon the consistency of the APIs. So we have, for example, an API common spec which informs each of these individual APIs on some key things that make them consistent. And then the deployments become consistent. That's kind of the, the vision, uh, the, you know, the concept of how we get to uh, feature APIs. So now let me turn to where are we at with respect to the standards? And then let me show you some examples of the implementations that have driven those standards. So we already have several parts that have been approved and published as open consensus standards. The first was OGC API for Features, part one core, was uh, published back uh, more than a year ago now. It's also now an ISO uh, standard, ISO standard through TC211. Uh, same document, uh, has the same, uh, has released in two venues. We are working on part two for coordinate reference systems. We've got uh, OGC API common, under development, and then um, there's compliance testing is now available for features part one. So this is a key aspect of things that are already uh, established. Um, what you can see, you can find those and the APIs that are under development in GitHub repos. And so every one of these specs has a GitHub repo associated with it. That GitHub repo then also links to a variety of implementations and results from sprints with respect to those implementations. So if you go to Open Geospatial on uh, GitHub, you can find that. If you go to the OGC APIs uh, webpage, you'll see also a, a developer-friendly uh, set of resources there uh, as well. But you know, in the end, if you want to get to the GitHub repo with the, uh, the structures that are uh, very developer-friendly, this is the way to do that. Uh, also, I mentioned um, Open API. This is the, the tool set and the consortium that allows for um, what was called Swagger to be able to publish um, APIs in a very uh, developer-friendly way that allows you, also allows you to do toolkits that create code stubs uh, for those APIs. So you can go directly from the open API uh, YAML representation through a set of tools into code stubs for your environment. Uh, so let me give you some examples, some, you know, di di diving a little bit deeper into the structure of these APIs because they're all very similar. So let's take a look at OGC API for features. There's uh, things that are very common. Uh, in fact, the, the API common spec defines a landing page, the definition and the conformance class uh, methods that are consistent across all the APIs. Uh, so those exist. And then uh, you get into for features, uh, feature collections, so collection of features, and, and then you can get to individual features. These are all methods that make up this API features interface. Similarly, you have for API for coverages, information about the API, a set of collections, which are now coverage collections, and then the coverage itself, which is based upon the coverage uh, implementation, the CIS standard, uh, uh, that describes the uh, the data structure for a coverage or a realization of that data structure. So that gives you a little bit of depth on um, the way the APIs are structured. Like I say, go to GitHub, go to Open API, and get even more uh, you know exacting and cut and paste, if you will, the um, uh, the method uh, paths. Let me turn to some deployment examples, uh, some uh, patterns for deployment, and then I'll show you the actual results results of those deployments and tests. So we've got data out there, right? Um, some people are going to want to very simply just a tile, uh, pull it back, make it work on my phone. So the tiles API does that. It's of course based on API common, uh, turns that data into a tile, serve it up on a phone. Some people are going to want the uh, features and feature geometry. Some just want it in WGS84, the coordinate reference system WGS84. You know, that's, a, that's a, for some groups that is uh, the perfect use case is all of it in WGS84. And so you can use API for features core and the query language that goes along with that. And it works very well to give you feature geometry in WGS84. 
if you are not working in WGS84, this is actually a coordinate reference system for Australia. Australia is moving. Uh, so WGS84 for some uh, uh, applications is not sufficient. You need the Australian uh, datum, uh, the, you know, moving a meter every 10 years, something crazy, right? Um, and so you need to be able to bring in the CRS aspect of the API that allows you to request features with a different CRS than WGS84. And some people are going to say, I'm a user, give me everything in a way, a bunch of different ways. And so the same resources that I showed you before, uh, now based upon API common, served up through those different uh, APIs is what a, what a user wants to be able to see. Um, so, you know, kind of a notional deployment example there. Similarly, thinking about a microservices deployment example, uh, here is, um, you know, an industry of uh, 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 Microsoft's um, a style guide for how to do microservices, right? And so what we want to be able to do is serve geospatial data through those microservices. So you use the API, OGC APIs on those container, microservice containers, so you can get uh, tiles, feature geometry, uh, features and geometry, and tile data and coverages. Um, similarly, the deployments you'll see going forward here, the implementations I'll show you in a moment also are cloud native. Um, and so we've worked out a, uh, a, a pattern, a deployment pattern associated in particular with Earth observation data. So the link down here is for the EO applications data pilot that's just completed and is on its way to becoming a uh, community best practice. Uh, but, you know, it ought to look familiar, right? App developer writes a uh, process, puts it in a container. Uh, and deploys that into a cloud hosted environment uh, using an API um, and tests it out using APIs. Uh, an app consumer comes along, accesses that data, those processes uh, using OGC APIs like I've shown you. I haven't talked to you much about encodings, but ones that you're probably familiar with, GeoTIFF, for example. Uh, OGC maintains the GeoTIFF standard. Uh, we're working with the COG folks to understand what COG and GeoTIFF uh, standardization looks like. Uh, HDF is an OGC standard. NetCDF is an OGC standard. Uh, ZAR was uh, brought to uh, the process recently to look at uh, ZAR as a community standard, which is very cloud native data science, um, uh, NumPy uh, friendly, uh, you know, analytics in the cloud kind of format. Uh, and so that data pattern is being worked out as well and open standards associated with that. Um, so those are some deployment patterns. Like I say, those APIs, those deployment patterns are being used in these API developments. So here you see for each of the APIs, how they've been initiated, how they go through several sprints, where they at are in the approval process with respect to the open standard and where we're at with respect to the site test, the conformance test. So that uh, anybody can use the conformance test harness and go there and use the test harness to test your implementation. Uh, of the APIs. And so, you know, the green, <laughs> I'll say it, a green wave is moving across this uh, uh, diagram. Go green. <laughs> How about that? Um, so the key message here is that sprints uh, are key to the development, uh, implementations and sprints and the innovation program, OGC uh, innovation program before we adopt these as standards. So let me give you a sense of what's going on there. Um, here are sprint hackathons and the innovation program over the past few years. Um, uh, ESIP, for example, jumps out at me, uh, given the coordination of ESIP and GRSS around coverage processing and analytics sprint and analysis sprint. Uh, from earlier this year, I'll show you some results of that, but there's been several tiles, pilots, and the like. Um, the second half, um, July, August, September, we just this uh, week, uh, conducted a sprint on the environmental data retrieval um, with links to observations and measurements. So that's a really key one coming out of the uh, environmental data, but also the Met Oceans kind of community is really spearheading that along with the um, uh, hydrology folks and the like. A really key one. And of course, our innovation program continues on with the test bed program, uh, which did a lot of access uh, implementation of the APIs in particular, the data access and processing API. So not only can you, let's take a grid example, um, not only can you request a subset or subslicing or subselection of a grid based upon grid indices, but you can also request, say, analytics on that averages or NDVI and the like 
That's what data access and processing API is, is getting after, working with a variety of cloud hosted providers right now uh, to, uh, to get that API on those analytics for um, remote sensing is really key right now. Uh, a couple others, you'll see the results uh, come to our December meeting, uh, December week of December 7th, uh, member meeting, you'll see the results there. You'll also hear about Testbed 17, call for participation in that December meeting, and um, Testbed 17, I'll have a bunch on APIs. So good stuff uh, at the end then is let's see some implementations. Let's see some um, you know examples and the like. So this one goes back to um, a sprint that was done earlier this year. Actually shows a combination of WMTS with tiles uh, rendered along with imagery that is remote sense data along with a, um, you know, a land cover um, data set that's been rendered into a tile and pulled together. Uh, so, you know, kind of what you'd expect the price of entry, this has got to work uh, to replace WMTS, the largest, um, you know, API for accessing geospatial data in the world. Um, and so that's a good one. Style data, so you want to be able to do that more GIS kind of functionality with very rich uh, geometries associated with them. This is pulling from the feature spec. I didn't mention much about styles, but the ability to go from geometry and styling it to whatever your favorite cartographic uh, you know, vision is of the way the styles ought to look and roads and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so to be able to handle that in an efficient fashion, um, so here's um, a good one from Hexagon showing, you know, um, a Northern Hemisphere and a, um, you know, so you can see the 3D perspective and the accurate rendering of that tile on a lat long grid, really. Uh, but it gives weather data uh, represented in the, uh, um, uh, just north of Japan, is that the Korean Sea, Japan Sea? I don't know, probably, it's probably disputed there, probably, right? So uh, you see a, a typhoon structure up there. A good one, uh, all of them are good, but Pi Geo API is a really good one that was demonstrated at the coverages sprint this past August. Pi Geo API does a lot of different APIs. Uh, this one was about coverages. Uh, this is Tom Carlitis's work in particular with uh, the, the weather, um, uh, the Met Office, the, that's not the right word, the weather service in Canada. Um, and being able to pull you know, global models and predictive models for weather using these APIs. Um, and so uh, really good stuff using something called coverage JSON. This is a nice one showing uh, terrain plus the, um, the um, so you got terrain as a visualization plus the line, I don't know if you can see it, but there's green lines showing the, um, the, the elevation ISO lines uh, that are um, accurately portrayed in 3D on top of that. Uh, so that's pretty sweet by a cherry, a Canadian company. And then of course, uh, urban environment with 3D models and being able to pull in uh, 3D containers of geo volumes and the like. This is an API that's coming out of the test beds, uh, the pilots, the innovation program uh, that's coming forward to do 3D uh, geo volumes. Uh, we look forward to seeing where this, where this comes in, into play. Okay, so um, this is where you find more, ogcapi.ogc.org. Uh, what I've shown you is kind of the, the vision of why we think APIs are important, why we need to transition from OWS to OGC APIs using web and uh, resource oriented design patterns in order to make that transition. Showed you the status of the standards uh, based upon a set of sprints and maybe some pretty pictures. Hopefully you thought they were pretty with respect to uh, imagery and gridded data, remote sensing and geosciences for um, uh, for the um, uh, using OGC APIs. So like I say, go there, find more. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you, uh, GRSS, tremendous organization. And um, I'll leave it there, Nathan. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to walk us through all this. This is really interesting. Um, you know, the, 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 the W star S technologies that you mentioned has been you know, such a foundation um, for for many years, and it's it's um, it's interesting to see the the path laid out forward that that, that you guys are are, are building. Um, so, to the audience, please use the chat box to submit questions. I think we have um, one coming in right now. Um, um, yeah, so please uh, jump in here and add some questions. If not, I've got a whole list here that I'd I'd like to 
you know, chat with you about for a few minutes. Um, first question, um, how are the major geo data providers like NASA adopting AGC OP, uh, uh, OGC APIs? Yeah, so um, without that, it's not, uh, it ain't there, right? So um, NASA and other, you know, uh, Earth observation groups like, uh, you know, I love NASA, but let's also talk about ESA and uh, the others and the like. So uh, Sentinel and Landsat use of these APIs, in particular out of, uh, what is it called, the Euro Data Cube and the Sentinel Hub and the like, um, are absolutely giving us good examples of that. The, the examples that I showed with respect to, um, well, the Met offices and the like, um, uh, also uh, doing the uh, implementations and the like. Uh, so without that kind of implementations that you see in those, uh, di those the graphics that I just showed, um, the key thing that they're looking for as well, right, is um, um, how do we get to an operational baseline? Uh, so all of us here are probably, uh, you know, good prototypers. We love to advance the technology. What we also need to look at is how those become standards. So we work with a variety of communities um, uh, who are doing APIs for Earth observation, and we learn collectively from that. And at the end of the day, we need to be able to have a stable basis that's backed up by uh, commercial products that are implementing those for the long-term activities associated with these agencies. And so uh, that's the key right now. Uh, we're at the level of saying, you know, it works, it demonstrates that. We need to move towards compliance tests. We need to work toward uh, deployed operational products that are saleable, all of that. That part is, is, is still yet coming, right? We've only got one standard, the features one, that is uh, officially adopted. Everything else I've shown you is in development and over at the end of this year, uh, we believe we'll have three or four more standards adopted uh, and next year even more. So, you know, it's a pathway we're on right now. Uh, the next question coming in is, um... Is the OGC API initiative focusing on FAIR data principle, F-A-I-R? So uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And the answer is yes. Uh, if you go to our, um, um, actually one of these pages, right? Maybe it's, uh, I thought this, one of these said FAIR on it. Yeah, there it is. Up in the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So FAIR is a set of principles that have been um, you know, promulgated um, uh, the uh, Research Data Alliance is uh, one of the key people we're working with on that. Uh, and what we're in the middle of a discussion, quite frankly, is uh, with the Architecture Board, the OGZ Architecture Board, as an open issue to say, how do the FAIR principles apply to APIs? Because FAIR principles, uh, predominantly, and especially the RDA approach, uh, and others, is that it's about data and data sets. And so working with RDA and a couple other uh, open FAIR, there's a couple other um, organizations working with the FAIR principles. Uh, Simon Cox has got an action uh, uh, out of Australia with the, he's a, a, a emeritus OAB member, and he's uh, giving us some recommendations about how we might even more so include the FAIR principles into the, uh, the adoption process associated with OGC standards. Uh, so it is yes, and even more so over time. So, um, you know, watch this space for if you're a fair advocate, uh, we are too, and we're advancing that. Uh, the next question here, I guess, is more of phrased in a, a comment. Um, I believe you can see it there. Um, okay. Maybe we, do you, do you want to make a comment here? I'm trying to remember if I know what 25010 is, but with respect to, oh, that's the software quality requirements spec. Okay. You know, we haven't used it directly. Um, we do have a set of guidelines for what the APIs uh, should be developed for. And so, you know, we aren't managing any code directly, right? You know, you could argue APIs are code. There's a Supreme Court case about whether APIs are code. Uh, but those standards, the 25010, is a little bit more about, you know, development of code uh, for what's behind the API. So certainly where we anticipate that the API uh, that we are developing will adhere to these guidelines for quality, uh, 
um, it, it's a little different than what 25010 would be calling out for, like the software development cycle and code reviews and uh, and regression testing and those kinds of things. That's not directly applicable to APIs, but we absolutely have a set of quality requirements and our guidelines for the APIs. So the next couple of comments here, I think are really kind of getting more towards the software implementations that we're so familiar using yeah, with the, yeah, uh, yeah. the, the WSTARS applications um, or um, can you can you comment about what this transition might look like and uh, yeah yeah so um, so we've got you know an established operational base uh, I mentioned the numbers um, you know millions of data sets available at OWS we are not going to walk away from those we will maintain those standards as long as um, there are issues to be updated associated with the OWS standards. They will be accessible as documents and publications on our website until, you know, I would imagine 30, 50 years from now kind of thing, right? Um, but we also anticipate people are going to transition away from those um, to the APIs because of the design principles behind the APIs makes it a whole lot easier to code to, right? So if you're picking up something new, and so the OWS um, resource types, you would notice a very similar, um, um, uh, very similar is the resource, like, you know, maps, features, and coverages are exactly the kind of uh, resources in the APIs. And so from a data representation point, they're highly aligned. It then gets into the discussion about, is it easy to build a facade, for example, on top of an existing, say, web feature service in order to serve up OGC APIs for features. And there are several examples, many examples of uh, developers writing facades uh, that enable that. And in some cases, we want to encourage that. We want the facade to be, you know, pretty much a straightforward, you know, no real code, no munging of the data at all. And other times there has been discussion that we have to make choices in order to make the APIs better than what the OWS service and therefore a facade may be more complex. And that is the active design process that's going on right now in all these sprints and the standards working group. And so I encourage you to get involved in you know, that kind of discussion about the transition uh, from OWS to the APIs. Uh, the, the organization, the consortium's doing it. Uh, individual organizations will have to do it based upon their own deployed baseline and where they wanna go with respect to the APIs. So the next question here, I think I'm going to break into two parts. Um, is is the, the the first one? I think kind of harks back to the question about ESA and NASA and the adoptions there. Um, is there any work for adopting the OGC APIs into uh, the data lake? Um, so I think there's a lot of questions about data access. I think there's there's, there's you know, other efforts going on in the community around things like Stack that may um, and you know there's this adoption kind of conversation going on. Maybe if you could uh, just address a little bit more your your thoughts on what that process might look like in like the future of data access, and then I'll get into um, uh, the the second part of the question there. Okay, so data lakes and let me say cloud hosted, cloud native, um, more generally. Uh, I referenced um, the um, the EO for um, the EO pilot. Uh, let me show you, let me go back to that slide. Um, because even though this is looks really simple, oops, this slide. At the bottom of here is the EO applications data architecture. This was a pilot that was done earlier this year. And it's all cloud native, cloud friendly, you know, AWS and other clouds uh, that are providing that data lake uh, capability. And so how do you put the interfaces on that? and how to use the OGT APIs. And in this same pilot was Stack and to a lesser extent, Cog. Stack for sure. Um, as you may know, Stack is consistent with OGC API for features. It provides access to records. And so it's also connected into records. Um, and where do we go with respect to um, you know, accessing tiles data? I've been contacted by some folks uh, that are building a big uh, earth engine for data uh, that says, you know, I'm looking at what you're doing with analytics on data and I'm looking at stack and where do these come together and how does COG fit into there? 
that's all a very active discussion right now. Uh, what we want to be able to do is use the same building blocks um, approach that says, you know, where things are the same, use the same building block where they need to be different, make them different. Um, uh, but let's not invent, you know, the same thing for, uh, so we're working that, um, like I say, stack was used in this pilot. Um, and it'll be this pilot, uh, the outcome of this pilot is being published as uh, what we call a community practice. An OGC community practice is underway development, but you can already find a lot of results about data lakes and cloud native and using the OGC APIs in this in this um, existing pilot. The second part here that I, I don't know hits on a question that I had written down uh, mentions processing um, in my I, I wanted to yeah. mention or kind of try to tie back to one of the slides where you had discussed uh, data access and processing API. Um, it almost like, and you, you were talking about how the NDVI uh, different analytics could be calculated um, on the back end and streamed via the API. Um, can you discuss a little bit the, the path forward for you know, attaching the analytics to the API? Are these dynamic analytics that you can stream, you know, uh, graph execution graphs along with them? Or is it kind of, are you, are you working towards like standard NDVI type band ratios and you know zonal statistics and like an eighty percent solution, or is this a generalized thing where you're you're asking the the, the provider or the hoster to to calculate a, a, a novel dynamic algorithm per call? Yep, yep. Um, so different communities, different groups are doing different things in these uh, in, in exactly what you described. Processing on let's let's say. Um, uh, data cubes or coverages or gridded data in general, right? Imagery and gridded data is the way I mm -hmm. phrased it over on the previous slide. Um, and so there's a range of discussion going on here, right? So in the pilot, the Earth observation pilot that I mentioned momentarily ago, there was not only use of the API for processing, which I haven't mentioned here, I should. Uh, OGC API for processes is uh, very key to that discussion. Um, and then workflow, uh, along with the direct uh, resource APIs like tiles and coverages. And so there is an ongoing discussion uh, based upon different use cases. You know, some people will be happy with a tile that gives me a geo tiff uh, that's in a tile matrix set. And, you know, and I'm happy with that as long as it gives me, um, let's say, a pre calculated variable, right? Uh, other people will want to do analytics directly on the data cube. Uh, and they want to be able to ask questions that are satisfied on the server side for some, you know, either being subsetting, subselecting kind of the data cube uh, uh, in, in both space and time. Uh, but then there's a the question about um, analysis, which does calculations on top of uh, the grid. So interpolation and averaging and, um, you know, more complicated uh, analytics associated with that grid. And so the processing spec API for processes, it allows you to deploy a process that can be invoked with the API. The coverages API allows you to use a coverage processing language that allows you to express those, uh, which you know results in you don't need to transfer code if the, um, the expression is satisfied on the coverage side. Uh, and then for example, making use of existing um, um, uh, statistical languages R and uh, and Python and the like on the other on the on the server side with things like notebooks. Notebooks were also another thing that were um, uh, developed quite a bit in the EO pilot that I mentioned. And so it ain't a simple answer. Sorry, Nathan. I you know it's 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 a work in <laughs> progress, and I see many different ways uh -huh. people are going. What do they want to do with AI? You know, I mean, machine learning. There's a couple of different things, and you guys are you know one of the world's best on that. So I, I would uh, welcome your input. Yeah, yeah. That's that. I, I was. Yeah, there's lots of conversations around this. Um, so I, I <laughs> let, let me just. I guess let me just move on half. to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, sorry, I got a little behind on the managing questions here. Uh, next question is, what are the advantages of using PyGeo API? Um, and just before you answer that, um, I'm going to have to go ahead and close down the questions here pretty soon. Um, we want to make sure we close on, we're 
probably we're about 10 minutes over the original scheduled time. Um, but uh, we'll, we have a couple of more here we'll go through and then uh, and close out the webinar. So the next question is, um, what are the advantages of using PyGeo API framework to implement the OGC API services um, versus uh, a direct implementation of the APIs via the, the, the like GitHub repos? Um, yeah, so uh, Pi Geo API is an uh, excellent framework because it implements all of the APIs that have been prototyped right now, lots of them, right? <laughs> I know that. Um, uh, whether it's, um, you know, I'm not going to comment about whether it's better than any other framework that implements OGC APIs uh, beyond the, the, you know, support, right? Because uh, my role is to be neutral with respect to the implementations. The, the best ones are the ones that meet the specs. Everything else you need to take a look at from your environment. Um, you know, Pi Geo API happens to be an open source one. Um, you know, there's a good team behind it. Uh, you may be more interested in a proprietary uh, solution uh, of, of an API. So that's always got to come into mind there. It's not something because we don't worry about the code that's behind them. We don't worry about it. We don't, uh, we don't comment about the code that's behind the API. Our role and our assessment of that is, do they implement the API? Did they meet the conformance test? Therefore, it's a good service, right? Uh, and Pi Geo API is really good with respect to that. Does it better support the machine learning, deep learning algorithms? I don't have a good, uh, good answer for that. Um, what he has shown, what Tom Carlitas and crew actually have shown very well in a variety of demonstrations is that it meets a lot of different data um, the way we've done most of the machine learning stuff in our um, test beds has been with a, uh, the processing API. So we've done a variety of algorithms, uh, different people, especially Krim out of Canada is the uh, one I'll call out because they've really done some really good stuff, uh, machine learning on a variety of things, but there's a bunch of others, you know, just by saying Krim, I've now upset other folks, but um, the processing API on machine learning demonstrated multiple test beds um, to be effective. Uh, so that's not anything unique to Pi Geo API. Lots of good examples. And a follow up from uh, the previous question where we were starting to kind of talk about, um, you know, the, the full stack of technology that needs to be brought to bear here. Um, so I'll just read the question directly. Continue on my, by, from my previous question related to uh, big data technology. I mean, if the OGC API, does it support parallel computing and storage? Because most of the advance that can be done later in the geospatial technologies will be most often uh, made possible by the distri distribution of both storage and computing as, you know, in a single, in a single um, interface. Absolutely, um, and APIs then enable that transition to distributed storage and computing, right? You don't care what's behind the API. You shouldn't care, you shouldn't have to care what's behind the API and how it's been deployed as long as it meets that API and performs well. Uh, but if you have large data problems, uh, you'll want to apply that API on, uh, I think this maybe is the same question that goes back to the data lake, uh, but there are other, you know, technology. I know Dask, for example, is one for, you know, pick your favorite um, 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 method for doing tasking across uh, multiple um, uh, cores and the like, um, uh, whether it's directly or through something like Spark. There's actually a really good project on uh, GeoSpark. There's actually several projects on Spark. Uh, that are moving towards using these APIs and could do that kind of analytics at scale based upon underlying um, uh, clustering and core technologies, you know, distributing the workload technologies. Um, so the APIs enable you to make use of all of that um, uh, cloud native scalability without having to worry about whether it's that, uh, you know, you could then just turn to another instance it's on a very you know when we start talking about edge computing where yeah they're going to be scalable at the edge but it's still some x86 processor that you know can only scale so much but the api shouldn't matter right if you're going to be able to do um, uh, machine learning at the edge the api ought to be the same will be the same as if you're going to do um, machine learning in an amazon cloud with the same api should be the same that's our objective 
Okay, um, last question. I think I it, it was asked a while ago. I've been keeping it on hold because I think it's pretty important. The question came from uh, Kuldeep Kurt. Um, what are the ways that one can contribute towards the OGC APIs? Yeah, I appreciate the, the question, Kuldeep. So um, uh, OGC activities, in particular the sprints, are wide open. Uh, go to the, uh, the page that I showed with respect to um, let me show you this link again, just to, to bring that to home. OGCAPI.org.OGC. Uh, we need widespread implementation and experience from everybody on the, every developer on the planet using it. Um, if you want to get involved in the, um, the community that's, you know, finalizing the standards, join OGC as a member. There's a variety of uh, ways and different levels of membership to join OGC. That gets you part of what's called the standards working groups uh, that then uh, vote, uh, you know, vet and vote the standards uh, for adoption. So open to everybody, join the OGC to be involved in the SWIG. All right, and with that, um, let me paste uh, that, that link again into the chat as well as some information about GRSS. So I wanna say thank you again, George, for taking the time to come here and discuss this. I, I appreciate it. I think it's been a very interesting and useful conversation. Um, to the audience members, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, be sure to follow along and um, join with GRSS so that we can, um, so that you're uh, able to be involved with the, uh, the future webinars and future events that we host. Um, thank you all very much. Have a very good day and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Nathan.